About two years after Isaac died, uh, his widow, Janet, uh, talked to our mutual agent, Ralph um, Pichinaz. Pichinaz, uh, and uh, she said, Isaac's books are vanishing from the shelves. We need to do something about it. So Which happens for every, every author who passes away. Is there a period of time yes, in the yes. walls? Very few authors. It's, is it a smart idea to die? <laughs> <laughs> Phil Dix is the obvious exception. Oh, and, and Billy Shakespeare. <laughs> um, so, Vichinaza got the idea that why don't we continue the foundation series? And he said, I got just the guy to do it. Why don't, why don't we offer it to Benford? Because uh, he made a whole lot of money out of the book with R.C. Clark. Um, interesting argument, which is true, but irrelevant. Um, but also, you'd gone to visit Isaac. Well, I'd been, I knew Isaac for decades and knew Arthur for decades. Exactly. Yeah, but um, so uh, he came to me and I said, you know, this is kind of a big deal. And I think if you really want to enliven it, you need a major campaign, not just one book. Uh, so I said, why don't I include my friends and we can. Uh, work together on it, and here they are. And uh, he said, yes, you know, I'm going to use that Richard Curtis advertising label of the killer bees. Uh, and so it all happened. So I wrote the first book and introduced, uh, and this is the one thing that really is, I think, original in the book, the idea of um, that psychohistory was not as Isaac explained it, because he said basically it's like perfect gas law. And I remember the first time I met Isaac, I said, you know, the key idea in the perfect gas law is that every collision erases memory. It's called a browning process. And so it's completely random what happens thereafter. It's the opposite of what you want of a theory of history. <laughs> <laughs> Did he appreciate that? He said, I hadn't thought about that. It was the only physical law I could think of that people would know. And so I concocted a one based on strange attractors and, and long range coherence theory, or, or which is a simulacral kind of word document about how you could construct a theory of history. I mean, let me look at, uh, for example, uh, a pr previous uh, psycho historians, uh, such as, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, Spengler. Spengler, right. Yeah. Spengler, and even Nietzsche. Uh, they had a, a kind of a, a social evolution idea that was, of course, not, not physics-based, but uh, well, was based on long-term cultural changes. The granddaddy was Marx. Yeah. Actually, yeah. the granddaddy was probably... Uh, yeah, but it was Groucho Marx. <laughs> <laughs> the recursal theory. The recursal history. Yes, yes. History repeats itself, and sometimes it even starts. Yeah, Vico <laughs> Yeah. So I put that idea in, and then I turned it over to these guys, and, uh, and they did sell very well, and they're still around, and uh, they really did help revivify Isaac's whole line because several publishers brought, reissued some of his books, not just the novels, but some of the nonfiction. Well, they brought out the foundation books again, too, in beautiful new editions. Yes, yes, beautiful new editions. And, uh, and luminaries such as Elon Musk fired it into solar system orbit in a Tesla. Uh, and I mean, what kind of a book endorsement is that? <laughs> <laughs> Being read by, by a space suit. You know, and maybe somebody, some alien visiting us 100 million years from now can map run across this and have their own copy of the foundation. Well, they'll see that car and they go, whoa, let's roar off on that or on the rings of Saturn. Yeah. So you don't get much of an endorsement better than that. You know, it's like being inscribed on the inside of the pyramids. Or something. Actually, I got a Sunday panel. Of Funky Winkerby in the Sunday papers. Oh yes, you did. And and that pretty cool. It's the only time I've been a character in a Sunday panel. <laughs> did you talk to him about this? No, no. I I wrote him afterwards, but David Wren pointed it out to me that I was in the Sunday papers. Mm -hmm. So we went out and bought I, one. I saw it too. And then I wrote to him and says, Hey, I'll give you a copy of the book. And he said it's the original art. Wow. And 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 we gave him a book. But the, uh, unfortunately, cartoonists today use magic markers and they fade. So we got gray cartoon. They, oh, got, they use magic markers to color their strips? No, to draw the lines. Right? And then the color is done later. So. Oh. Uh -huh. But yeah, that, it had, had weird resonance in a lot of ways. But here's the thing we did is as we got met together with, with a silver sack, 
The editor? Also the same. Uh, the editor of what? Oh, our Foundation? books. Foundation? No. Gosh, who was it? <laughs> you see, that's the good thing about editors. About memories. <laughs> anyway, the it was, we met with the editors and, and said, you realize, you know, how are you going to promote this? Well, we're calling it, you know, if you three guys writing Asimov's books. It says, it's the second Foundation trilogy. Right. Yeah. And they go, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and they wrote it down. <laughs> but can you imagine a publisher not getting that right away? Oh, well, you know, they can't count. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't. One count. too many, because, you know, yes. which was yes. true of us. Uh, there was one too many of us, because I had to fit my way between these guys. They were marching over the entire Asimov universe. He was pulling together every single Asimov book to fit them into his novel. And I had to find a way in between. And I realized the best way to do that was he was doing the beginning. He was doing the ending. And so I fit my way into where the foundation books begin. Right. Mm -hmm. The first week is the, is the length of my novel. And that's all it is. It's one week in the history of the Foundation, sir. Right. What did you think of my solution to the problem about why there are no aliens in the galaxy, just humans? What did I think about it? Yeah. Oh, no, I, well, I think what they think about it. Well, what do you think is more important? <laughs> this is a first. Anybody? Do you remember? <laughs> yes. So if the books are intended to be about man's um, movement into space and developing of a galactic wide civilization, aliens would only mess that up. So, not having them was a good thing. You know how that actually came about? Is that uh, John Campbell was, did not believe there could be aliens that were smarter than humans. I'll, except for Paul Anderson later on, he kind of allowed that to happen. But for Asimov, back in the 40s, no way. That's why Dune has only humans. Mm -hmm. also. Uh, Actually, Campbell's, sandworms. Campbell's yeah. belief was that there was nobody smarter than Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> but there was that to do, and Asimov had to deal with that as, what, 20 years old or 19? Yeah. When he was first writing the first stories. And so that's why he penned that down, is no humans. But that's one of the tropes in Campbellian science fiction. And it solves a very paradox. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I undermine that. Shall we? Does anybody remember how I undermine that? <laughs> the robots got there first, and they exterminated the aliens. <laughs> Terraforming in order to make places for humans to spread. Right. Um, and what I did was I made that a matter of. 20,000 year war among the robots mm -hmm. that they all sides deliberately kept us ignorant of because there would be factions of robots who think that the destruction of entire ecosystems to make earth-like planets for humans to expand ignorantly into would be a crime as most of you would think yes. but the uh, dominant thread of robots under Daniel Oliva, um, they, the ones who are called Giscardians, because they believe in the zeroth law of robotics, that what's good for humanity excuses anything they do. Which Asimov actually had. He only had that. Yes, and, and I never quite understood that. Well, it, it, it allows them to do anything they want, including disobeying us. Mm -hmm. Even though the first law um, says, there's three laws. Yes, the, the first law says they cannot harm us, and it allows them even to kill human beings if it's for the greater good of all of humanity. So that's history. That's how history gets written. Yes. <laughs> but, but the whole the whole thing about this uh, three laws thing was, or actually about the, uh, Asimov merged the two, the robot novels and the Foundation trilogy in the late 80s, early 70s? No, it was the late 70s. And I remember, uh, I wasn't anywhere near the fan that these guys were. Uh, when I, uh, I didn't know much about fandom and all that, but I did know that almost all my friends and I were incensed that Isaac was uniting these two universes. <laughs> the robots, humanity has robots in the 1990s. His 1990s, our 2050, whatever. 
Um, and yet, 20,000 years from now, in the Galactic Empire, they are calculating orbits with slide rules, and there are no robots. <laughs> How do you know? Sounds like Doom. They only appear to be slow. <laughs> it sounds very much like Doom. Yeah. And it's kind of a retro thing. For very similar reasons. And the, um, because Kelly Fries could paint a really good slide roll. <laughs> yeah. and, and the, so, so the, the subsequent 40 years, he spends um, rash, coming up with rationalizations for this. Um, which was originally just an utter self-indulgence. Mm -hmm. And the only rationalization... Which sold books for him, though. Yeah, well, the only... It would have been good, better artistically if he had kept two separate universes and just written them. What, what but, did, what did uh, Judy Lynn give him for one of his for one of his advances for writing a new foundation? No, it, wasn't, uh, it was a million dollars. Okay, that's a rationalization. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, the point is that, that if, if you look at, uh, at Isaac's arc, uh, moving from the foundation and moving onward, and backfilling story, um, you see a series of decades in which Isaac argued with his earlier self. First, it's like humans are like gas molecules, and then you can predict them with a variation on gas molecules. Then they re he realized there are perturbations. You need somebody to herd things back into, into, into place if you want to plan. And perturbation, grand perturbation example was the mule, uh, or Donald Trump. <laughs> and, and then um, he realized that he was making an elite, lordly class of mutant humans. Mm -hmm. And he was recreating feudalism, which he as an American who had escaped from that mess. And he knew history very hated well. it. He escaped from the Soviet Union. Right. And he so he hated these hierarchies of humans. So he said, what's the model that could get me out of that? And he gave us the robots united into his universe. And now you realize that it's not a Roman Empire, it's a Chinese Empire ruled by eunuchs. Very true. And so these are eunuchs who cannot have heirs and therefore cannot be a lordly inheritance caste. And so he went, ah, solve that. And then he realized 10 years later, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> the, the servants are few uh, and, and impervious and omnipotent and omniscient, and the masters are cheaper than dirt and in their quadrillions and utterly ignorant. Something's got to be done. And so he came up with Gaia, Galaxia, as the only way that he or Clark or uh, many other of the stylish science fiction authors of that time could imagine humans overcoming our beastliness, and that is becoming a mega overall mind. And then he died. After hinting at the next and what might be final argument. And that is bringing it all around full circle to where the terminus and the foundation itself becomes important again. And that I consider to be my job. Yes. Which he did a good job on. Now, the thing about it is that there was already uh, Olaf Stapleton who had conceived of so many things we find nearly all science fiction in the 30s. Uh, but especially for these empires and stuff, what he didn't conceive of was interstellar travel being very effective. So and it uh, might not yet be. True, and it might be true. But uh, but he, he actually had intelligent galaxies in one of his books. And 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 the, anyway, we could wax prolific about, uh, about Stapleton, but what what Isaac brought into this was the largest, and maybe it was because he was so young, the largest space empire anyone could have imagined, a quadrillion human beings distributed amongst the stars. The one thing I always found problematic was what kind of history or culture could exist with that large a set? How many splintering groups would you have? But there, it was ruled by the empire. How could that? How could that empire? So when I wrote my book, I'm writing. You know, I wonder how thorough this empire is or can be. But also the rules of history. I wrote Foundation and Chaos, 
which is chaos theory makes this whole thing very, very difficult to manage, especially with a quadrillion. I mean, you're talking about gas laws. It's like every human being is an atom. And that quadrillion ruling, I could not believe in it. So he had it on an entire planet, which looks a lot like Star Wars. In fact, Star Wars is deeply influenced by Foundation. Mm -hmm. Coruscant's yeah, Right, and, and you, you see that, and I think Tim Zahn may have made that obvious in one of his books. Mm -hmm. but, but the fact is, he never could make that work, nor could I. But I did have a chance to make uh, Arganil Olovar the oldest living human being. And then bring him back after he's destroyed. And that's the one thing Janet didn't. She, she liked my book a lot. I liked all of our books. But she wrote, says, you know, Isaac never believed in the afterlife. So I'm not sure I believe that you could have this robot come back. I says, look, he's a robot. You know. But I also had a weird experience. As I am writing this book, I'm writing the, the, the foundation book that I was working on. After he had... After Gregory finished and before David really leaped into it, I was writing this book in my office and I got a phone call and it's Harlan Ellison. And Harlan says, you know, Greg, I have this idea, this really cool idea about science and vampires. I was, I was going to call Isaac and talk about it, but then Susan reminded me, Isaac isn't with us anymore. And at that point, there was a voice in the back of my head and it said, so Harlan, how can I help you? <laughs> And we had a good conversation. I replaced Isaac. And I have no idea what that means, but it's the first instance in which I have actually channeled another science fiction writer. <laughs> for another science fiction writer. So. Well, we all try to, to some degree. Yeah. I mean, um, I think, as far as voice is concerned, and rhythms and patterns, I think Greg uh, Bear did the best job of... Also, it was a short time period. Yeah. Now, yeah. um, what I, uh, just so you know, um, the Benford novel is set when Harry Seldon is a young, vigorous young man having adventures with his wife, Doors, and they have, they have some pretty weird adventures. Uh, and, and he's a set, mathematician. Yeah, he's, a ma he's still a mathematician. He has not yet become a politician. Um, Greg Bear's novel is set in the period a week just really dialing up to the um, dealing with Linga Chen and the and the security agencies and all of that and, and what to do about getting the terminus plan going my novel takes starts with the line as for me I am finished does anybody remember that line mm -hmm. that's one of the things, that's the last thing that you ever hear Harry Seldon say in one of the um, tapes that are played in the secret chamber in Terminus. Um, he has recorded all of this, all of these messages for the future. Um, and now he's done. He has no further role to play. The younger psychohistorians are leaving for Terminus with those who have been shanghaied and uh, and had their lives ripped up in order to be sent to be experimental guinea pigs at the edge of the galaxy. There's nothing left for him to do, and he has his the greatest adventure of his life in the last month of his Which life. Is, that's the way, that's like a total comrade novel. Right. So one of the things we did was, it was a fairly loose collaboration as far as the novels were concerned, but we did, especially these guys were very kind about planting in seeds mentioning things that I needed. So I needed an explanation for why humans would be so stupid for 20,000 years, um, so easily manipulated. And the explanation is that, uh, how many of you remember Caves of Steel, where Earth, Earth humanity is just hiding from the sun, hiding from the naked sun? Same as Isaac. <laughs> um, which is also in the foundation books. Yes. And my answer, which these guys kindly agreed with, that I think ties everything together, and that is that the humanity in the foundation universe, in Isaac's entire universe, except for the early Susan Calvin the robot novels, has been mutated. 
they were mutated by a disease. And every time they get close to having a true renaissance where they, a human civilization can truly take off, um, chaos ensues, foundation of chaos. And um, what's happening is a fair number of humans are starting to be immune to this. And Daniel realizes that he, this is his last chance to control human destiny before all these immune humans become a major factor. And it ties in together. Janet said that she thought it tied together. So, and, and it was a success, I thought. I mean, considering that we're dealing with a, a mind that had envisioned this galaxy spanning vast culture and society, an entire series of novels written by an agoraphobe. Yes. <laughs> So, like Tranger because it was like Manhattan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only reason he would go outside was to go to a good deli. Yeah, which was really luckily in life. the same building as right. Right. <laughs> well, right. They, right. they oh, say yeah. that at the Apollo uh, Mania was the 11th <laughs> launch, there was but some science fiction authors on a yacht mm -hmm. like, watched the takeoff. And it was in the countdown, it was in the last 60 seconds. And someone said, Where's Isaac? And everybody went quiet and they heard tap 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 ding tap 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 yes. <laughs> and somebody ran downstairs uh, and dragged <laughs> Isaac onto the deck just in time to watch the launch and he, he supposedly I think it was Paul who described this he said he said uh, Isaac went huh and within, and within 60 seconds there was tap 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 ding tap tap tap, tap, tap ding <laughs> That's how we got four hundred. It's a right. sad <laughs> comment on the state of our reproduction and fandom that you all got that. <laughs> Think about that. Hey, they're coming back. Sure Typewriters. A large number of young people here who got no idea why it was going. But, to be. but if you're reading the foundation mm -hmm. books, the most nightmarish thing that happens to Harry Seldon in the first book is he's caught outside on the surface of Trent yes, in right. the rain. Mm -hmm. That's nightmarish mm -hmm. for Isaac. Also for his own. Right. He told me the story of how he took a girl in high school out on a date and they took the roller coaster for the first time in his life. And it was he never did it again because he had wet himself. Hard to do on a date. I mean how did he get away with it? But that was Isaac for me. He became more so, Janet told me, the older he got, the more peripheral aroused. Side. I mean, I've been to. Have you? Did you go to his apartment? I was there several times, and I noticed a pattern. First, there were no chairs sitting on an exterior wall. None of the windows in his office were. Could you see through? Because they were covered by heavy drapes, uh, and he had never been outside onto the small balcony, but for, for that book of photos of SF writers that we were all in, uh, he was in a tuxedo about to go out to some kind of event, uh, uh, and, and he agreed for the photographer that he would back on to the balcony so, so that he, the photographer got the view behind him, and then he would walk forward, never moving his eyes to the side, <laughs> and that's how he dealt with life, and, and he had two desks set up. And a chair on rollers and two different computers here because he always worked on two two projects at a time. If he was stuck on one, he'd go to the other. He said, and he showed me this. He said, "See, if I stop here, I can just kick off and roll over and turn around." And, and he literally did work that way. Uh, pretty amazing. A very controlled personality. So one of the other things that he would do would get him outside is to go be interviewed. And that's how, as kids, I think we got most familiar with Isaac yes. was on. on uh, different talk shows mm -hmm. where he would be brought on. He did a, a great job. He was a stand-up comedian, really. Oh, yeah. yeah. Logical. He was fun. And, and he was great fun, and they loved interviewing him. And Isaac became the, the Carl Sagan of wow. his time and, and explaining did, things radio. to him. And he did <laughs> right. conventions, and he behaved in ways that today would um, get slapped down, but people thought was cute then. Yeah. Well, some of them did. Most, but not all. Mm -hmm. 
the, the, the whole pattern of, of writers being agoraphobes is fairly obvious that agoraphobes would be drawn to do that because you work indoors all the time. I mean, Dean Koontz is another such example, by the way. Um, and I know several others. And they all, well, the, the ones I know anyway, are incessant writers. They have a crucial need all the time. And it seems true to Dean Koontz. They typically work seven days a week. And that's their addiction. Uh, and Isaac told me a story about how he finally, after years of nagging by Janet, they'd gone off for a week in the Adirondacks or someplace. And he was up there at this place. Uh, and, and they had dinner with other people. He was not crazy about that either. Uh, uh, and and the woman at the table, after Isaac did his, routine, his comic routine, and he was telling jokes and all that stuff, so she said, Isaac, gosh, you, you know all these, these jokes. Have you ever... Uh, Start about a joke book, and he said, "Aha!" He went to the uh, hotel and said, "Have you got any stationery?" <laughs> and he got a ream of stationery and wrote by hand an entire joke book from memory. He told me the story. I said, "Really, from memory?" He said, "Yeah, I, I have the way I, I can write so much science and stuff is when I learn something, my mind files it so it's readily accessible. I mean, it's like Wikipedia or something." And, and, and I said, well, you even jokes? He said, yeah, sure. I said, okay, I said, tell me a joke about a camel. Boom, tell me a joke. Oh, said, tell me another <laughs> Boom. Yeah, camels are the prime source. <laughs> <laughs> Only to some people, David. <laughs> <laughs> and th he told me through four camel jokes, camel jokes in the span of a minute. I could. Camels are that. Are that funny? Okay. John W. Campbell. Okay, I'm going to time this. They're <laughs> dirty. They're all dirty. French Foreign Legion got a recruit. Find what? some no. <laughs> Why they're all dirty, David? Not <laughs> Isaac's jokes were dirty. Yes. You've never been to an Arab country, have you? <laughs> you've, you've never, never, seen, seen, you've never seen a camel. <laughs> I've ridden camels. Look, I was telling, I, I was telling about, uh, I was having political discussion with some guys in, in Washington D.C. And, and and they were talking about uh, various symbolisms things. And I and I said, you know, all this business about Obama bowing too low to to the Saudi king. There are pictures of 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 Bush walking hand in hand yeah. with princes who he says help raise him. And there's one of them say, kissing the the Saudi king right on the mouth. <laughs> And, and one guy said, well, to be fair, have you seen him? It's <laughs> 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 a pretty good one. It's, it, it's only distantly related to camels. Uh, look, uh, to, get, to get serious for a second, to get serious for a second, what we're talking about with, with Asimov uh, is, is one form or another of what's called teleology. And that is the tendency to believe that history is foreordained in some way. Now, we have a, this is very redolent for us today because mystical people have a tendency to be attracted to that notion. We've mentioned Spengler before and Marx. If you're a person of the left, you have a tendency for your teleology to be about how things with fits and starts are inexorably upward. There's Marx for you. If you're conservative, there's a tendency for your teleology to be cyclical. And so you have these horrible things like the Titler calumny that says that you know all nations rise to to vigor and then they then they get lazy and their children become you know fall back into slavery which hardens them and there's a recent thing called the fourth turning it's a pile of crap about how uh, Americans go in in cycles of four generations um, and, and so. Teleology is something that I'm particularly sensitive to, and yet, of course, in his universe, um, it's absolutely 100% about teleology, of one form or another. And I've talked a, a lot of science fiction histories were at that point. Oh, of course, you know the Dune, the, Dune, the, Dune, the Dune series. Um, uh, uh, one of my favorite of all uh, science fiction authors, uh, who was probably the greatest single storyteller in all the history of science fiction, is a guy named Paul Anderson. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll write it down for you. <laughs> and and he, he believed in, this, in, these, um, in the cyclical. Actually, he, he, he was not a fanatic about... He cyclical. was not a fanatic about anything. He liked anything that gave him story ideas he could sell to Campbell. That's right. 
And so we have many different histories, which we, you know, um, and, and many different societies, and, and he just loved any theory that could give him a good story idea. Yeah. No, that, that actually, story was always paramount to him, and he could give you a good Marxist socialist one if you give him a good reason for it. I'm not sure he was willing to do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, um, are, are any of the things we've discussed um, got you thinking with questions or. Um, is there any particular point that you want sold a little more before you rush out and buy our books? <laughs> <laughs> Sir. So, Asimov talked quite a bit about his extensive research library, and that was reflected in Jerry Sullivan's research library. Do you guys do the same thing? Do you have a research library in your desk? Well, your Isaac's research library that I saw in Manhattan was about half the size of this room, and it was floor to ceiling. I have large numbers of books in four different homes and a uh, storage unit full of books. Uh, so, but I also have one of my homes is on the University of California Irvine's campus, uh, and there are over two million books in the libraries I can walk to. And what's more, I can because I'm a faculty member emeritus. I can simply tell a librarian that I want a book delivered to my department mailbox and it's there with usually within hours so I don't need no more library <laughs> this, this is the guy who had the Kells of California have supplied me with everything I need he had the, uh, the book of Kells delivered to him in Dublin and he hasn't returned it yet <laughs> <laughs> well they uh, actually like me uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, the most recent book I requested was the Dog of the South by Charles Portis, mm -hmm. which is, has gotten great reviews uh, and is out of print mm -hmm. and was in the repository library of UC because nobody had checked it out for 20 years. So mm -hmm. I had it brought to me. And, I'm, and, and it's actually quite an amusing, funny story. Of course, it's been utterly eclipsed by Portis's other novel, True Grit. His other uh, novels are much lesser than True Grit. But he does voices very well, uh, as you learn in True Grit. Read the book, it's really good. Yeah, the, the, the book is better than either of the movies, in my opinion. So one, one of the uh, upshots of, of being told that you can't publish, if you guys were on a previous panel, you can't publish a book with four authors, or five authors, or however many we can get in yeah. part of the comment. Um, Neil Stevenson came along and put a, put a bunch of martial artists and sword players together. And, and with Chloe, my, my uh, child back there, uh, involved in all of this and fighting with us and all this stuff, we did this and, and he said, well, let's put a story together, Neil says this. And so let's, you know, all write on this story. And we all contribute to it because the Mongolia, which has seven writers involved. And every New York publisher that Neil was associated with says, we can't do a work with seven authors on it. And Neil says, okay. So he, he took it away and we took it to Amazon Publishing. And this was their first, one of their first major possibilities. They grabbed it and they did it with seven authors. And they did it faithfully and they put them on the book cover and all that stuff. And they sold hundreds of thousands of copies of the four volumes of this set. Hmm. And they did a beautiful special editions. Yeah. At the WhoCon recently up in LA, one of the BBC <coughs> writers that was there was saying that's one of the distinctives between the American TV production process. It's a writer's room versus the BBC. He said to this day, it's single writer, single vision. He said, and one of the things they're hoping that will come back across the pond is that multiple writer's room approach. And so I could see how, you know, it, I, I didn't think about it, but I guess it is a distinctive of the American well, Neil is occasionally crazy. In this case, he was absolutely crazy. And because he's Neil, he made it work, and the publishers made it work. Yeah. So Amazon learned how to sell books based upon these books. Had all their salespeople go out there, they advertised at Comic-Con, they did all this stuff. So it's a different world now than it was back in 1980. Uh, but so I, I always point out that the, the most successful fantasy novel of all time had many different authors 
We now, and it's not a copyright uh, because it's the Bible. <laughs> no plot, unfortunately. <laughs> Memorable characters. <laughs> I've heard that, yes. Yes. Um, for the panel, um, are you approaching the upcoming Amazon adaptation with trepidation or anticipation? A foundation? A foundation, yeah. Oh. God only knows. Well, well, since we're not involved. Yeah, and it, it's too bad because, uh, you know, we're collectively truly Asimovian experts. Um, I, unfortunately, I can't remember the name of the guy who I recently read his fan fiction take directly from our trilogy. I think I sent you a link for it, didn't I? Oh, uh, you mentioned that, I don't think I got the link. Yeah, because I, I wound up drawn in, I was going to read the first chapter and, and make a nice comment. I read the whole darn thing and it was actually very good. Is it a whole book? It's a whole book, and I, and I thought that it ought to be canonical. This is a, one of the fears I have, because you know I'm the one up here who cared the most about um, this notion of whether or not it will be thought of as a canonical thing. As, uh, you know, uh, these guys uh, paid a tribute to Isaac and cashed the checks, and uh, actually, I'm kidding. Um, I did cash the checks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, you? I, I, am, I am a bit of a fetishist, like, like, like your father-in-law. Uh, to me, the story mattered Paul more. cashed than, the checks, too. <laughs> more than anything else. So that's why I went off and I reread Pebble in the Sky, Currents mm -hmm. of Space, mm -hmm. The Naked Sun, uh, Caves of Steel. Uh, and, and I found ways to tie all of those obscure early ones in. Yeah. But you know, the fact is that people change over the years. Isaac had great titles like that when he was younger. You know, uh, the, the stars like dust. Pebble in the sky, um, and later his novel, his his titles were uh, Foundation, Second Foundation, Foundation and Robots, Earth and Robots, Earth Foundation and Robots, uh, Earth Foundation Robots and Spam, Spam Robots, <laughs> Robots, Robots and and Earth Spam, uh, Spam Spam. And it showed well because you know it 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 made more money. Editors, and sold editors more might have had something to do with it. Editors might have had a lot to do with it. But also, uh, you got to remember that uh, when he delivered these robot stories to Campbell, Campbell around 1949 or 48, maybe even later. Uh, said to him, you know Isaac, and Isaac would come down and visit him in his offices. Apparently he was less claustrophobic in the 40s. Uh, but, but he got on a meet with Campbell and Campbell says, you know, there's, I'm finding these similarities in all of your stories. They're kind of broken down into three different rules. And so he wrote the rules down, and Isaac went and looked at the story and says, Campbell's right. It was Campbell who actually wrote down the three rules of the box. And, and so, and Isaac fell in love with that, and, and it became part of his career and campaign. Uh, and Isaac would do that with, or Campbell would do that with a lot of people. He was a goofball, and just helped them. He was a storytelling master. He only had a few quirks, you know. I like Scientology. That was one. But it, was, <laughs> that it, was, was one. it was Dianetics, and he gave up. Yeah, he gave up on, on yeah. uh, that whole thing. And the, the Force the fields will be any day now. Right, <laughs> right. But also the racist come, he, he was, had issues that way, which Isaac did not have. But Isaac worked with Campbell. And it's interesting that the high lines backed away, I think after Isaac wasn't writing science fiction much, the high lines backed away from Campbell in the 1950s. And Jenny later said, yeah, he was a bigot. We just couldn't work with them anymore. And they didn't sell any more Heinlein books to Steiner. And yet, Campbell could do the Dune books with all of their various things. And he could do the Paul Anderson books with the Ithrians and the, all that sort of stuff. Frank Herbert told me that, that Campbell had no influence on the Dune books. That, that right. Frank just delivered them, broke it up into pieces so mm -hmm. they could be serialized, and there it was. Yeah. And, and all that. So. But, 
that, that was an interesting exception because yeah. it was delivered full of horror. Well, one of the anthologies that Steve Potts and I are thinking about is called The, the Next Expansion. And it's asking a very science fictional question, and that is, what will be the next expansion of rights and dignity that we don't expect? Because um, our lives, our nation's life, has been one in which each generation expands the circle of inclusion. So you think the, the issue of uh, rights for AIs will be next? I think that AIs are already being discussed. Um, and uh, we're seeing an awful lot in, in gender and in uh, all sorts of other human variants. Yeah, but we're running out of genders. I tell tell that to Roger Zelazny and Philip Jose Farmer. Um, <laughs> Hard to do. But the, <laughs> the, the point is, but David's done it, Gregory. Right? The, the point is that 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 our, this one is about uh, this anthology is about the notion of what would be next. Personally, I think what's next that will surprise everybody is I think gossip will be recognized as the incredible evil. But it's an essential part of our diet. Yes, there is that. It's like as carbohydrates. Well. <laughs> okay, that's his meat. And that's well, go fair. Gossip is the first draft of history. Well, in any event, though, <laughs> if, if you're, if you're a fan of the lesser Roman historians, you'll see. <laughs> the reason I'm saying that is because how do you judge someone like Campbell? How do you judge someone like, like Isaac, whose behavior at cons in retrospect was not good? How do you judge Thomas Jefferson? And the, the thing that I think lets you scope people out in that sort of grand context is, did they try hard to be better than their time? Yeah, but you're, you're calling for an end of finger pointing, and that's not going to go well with this generation when they're coming up. That's the only sport they've got left. That when you're looking at screens. We're at an end. <laughs> but we are censoring ourselves. This has got to be more. something like the 20th panel we've done, we three together. Uh, so yeah, should there be a moratorium? <laughs> oh. 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 No. I will plug these because these are the only two copies left in San Diego <laughs> County. Um, in, in the uh, mysterious galaxy, I'll put them out there. Great fun. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.